What I would like to do is to give you my take, and it's a personal take, on the different ways uh, <clears throat> by, which under, uh, by which the Euro crisis has been and still is changing the European Union as a union. And I would like to, <clears throat> to go over four aspects of it briefly. First of all, how it has been changing or qualifying some of our basic tenets about solidarity and sovereignty. And I think in a way there are two sides of the same coin. Secondly, <clears throat> what does the Euro crisis mean for our future economic policy and policies? Mm -hmm. Then I would like to say a couple of things on uh, redistribution of power inside the European Union. And then to conclude, I would like to, <clears throat> to give you my sense of what has been happening in terms of uh, how the institutions have been changing on the ground. Of course, they have not been changing formally because they are embedded in the treaties, but a number of, uh, as a number of elements are uh, shifting. First of all, I think we have been testing the limits of uh, solidarity and the limits of sovereignty to the very full. The ones who had difficulty with more solidarity were the ones who had difficulty with the limits of sovereignty and vice versa. Still, I think that if you make, if you make the list of the different guarantees or if you make the financial guarantees, or you make the list of the political capital invested by a number of leaders to try and keep everybody in the same club, you see that solidarity was quite impressive. But, now two buts. First of all, if you look at this, what happened in terms of solidarity during the Euro crisis, solidarity, as you know, in Ireland, did not come free. Particularly in the very beginning, uh, when there was lending, it came at high interest rates. I admit that over time, we succeeded in bringing them down again. And that they were always accompanied by uh, painful measures of an IMF type. That's my first but. The second but is that solidarity as well uh, often was granted because the ones who granted it felt that if they did not do so, they would harm their own interests. So solidarity, if you look at it in terms of figures, was uh, quite impressive, I think, but there is a double but, a double footnote to it, and I can brief, be brief about it given the country in which I'm speaking now. The limits of sovereignty were tested as well. Uh, we have been, as, a, as, a, as an organization, uh, as a union, uh, been imposing fiscal discipline, which uh, we would call budgetary discipline, economic discipline on subjects which in all welfare states are the bread and butter of winning or losing elections. I mean, if you see the number of constraints the number of disciplines which are now coming into place, um, for instance, on, on, on uh, national budgets, you must, must see that that means that uh, an important part of budgetary margin of maneuver has been abandoned to Brussels. Uh, and this is the more important for a number of uh, countries is that what you do with your budget, what you do with your salary policy, what you do with your pension policy is, of course, the stuff for which people vote in favor or against you. Now, as a consequence, of course, then, uh, there were a number of recent studies on that. The popularity of the European Union project are, let's say, is not what it used to be, speaking as a diplomat. And <coughs> Does that endanger the, product, the project as such? Um, of course, 
Uh, answering that question is a bit of crystal ball gazing, and I'm not sure that my crystal ball is better than anybody else's. But I think that it does not really, at least for the, ti for the time being, endanger the uh, project as such, um, and for a number of reasons. If push comes to shove, and I'm thinking now about the Greek elections, people tend in, to take decisions in or to vote in function of their, their own understood best prospects of future. But there are limits to rationality as well, I admit that. Um, I think the second reason why it doesn't endanger the project is that nobody sees what the alternative could be. And people are smart enough if they want to abandon something to first look at what they get in Stead and in you. And then I think there's a third reason, which uh, <coughs> for me comes from 40 years of, uh, 42 years of diplomatic experience, is that every time Europe was in a crisis, it ended up with more Europe and ever with less Europe. Uh, why is that? Uh, uh, will that always be like that? It's like asking the question whether Newton's apple is not going to fall upwards the <laughs> next time. But I think we are seeing now again, having going through this crisis, that uh, it ends with more, rather with more Europe than with less Europe. And behind it is the is a simple human factor: is that people um, and governments rather prefer to deal with predictable unpleasantness than with unpredictable unpleasantness. And it has been like that for 40 years. Um, and I think what we have been seeing now proves that it did, it, that is still the rule. Now, very personally, if we want to have uh, further exchanges between solidarity and sovereignty. That will only happen if the right context is there, and the right context is political union. Now, it may seem strange to many of you uh, to talk about this subject now, but I'm saying, well, we have been testing the limits of sovereignty and <coughs> solidarity, I think we are, will not be able to go much further than that unless you change the context, and the context then is changing the context means more integration, uh, which is certainly the position of a number of governments, but which is as, as certainly the, not the position of, a num of as important a number of other governments. So that is my first point, testing the limits of sovereignty and solidarity. Now, my second point is about the economy. Uh, and particularly the economy in the Eurozone. Um, I think we, we have now uh, bridged much more than the, was the case in the past, the distance, the gulf which separated monetary policy from economic policy. We all knew from the very beginning when we started with the monetary union, and you can read it in the Delors report, that a stable monetary union needs a stable economic union, and we thought we could do the trick by putting two locks on the system, one budgetary and one monetary. Both locks were picked apart, the, both the budgetary lock and the monetary lock, <clears throat> and there we were with, with this uh, crisis. In the European Council, leaders have tried to bridge, <coughs> or to, let's say, to rebuild the locks. They have done a number of things which were going to stay with us for many, many years to come. First of all, we restored budgetary discipline. And uh, I wouldn't say that that means that all the existing budgetary trajectories are immutable. We had one adaptation in the case of Spain uh, last year. Uh, but unilateral budgetary laxity, <clears throat> um, I think, it has now has now become a thing of the past. It was practiced in the past 10 years with all the consequences we know. Uh, so I think that budgetary discipline is, has now become something for real. Um, this creates, of course, this enormous problem of austerity, 
slow growth. Um, and this uh, is something on which the European Council developed an agenda for, uh, for growth. Uh, but with the margins of maneuver which are there, uh, if budgetary discipline is the rule, where are the margins? Now, some countries may have some, some margins. Germany let last year increase its salary policy by a much higher percentage than, than before. We have been using EU policies uh, to try and get some growth, but um, the fact remains that we are confronted as a consequence with low and negative growth uh, and with all the social consequences of of it, and uh, this is very much on the mind of the members of the European Council, but at the same time, nobody really wants to go back to square one, and again, come in the situation where budgetary laxity gives you a short-term growth, but then with the price to be paid afterwards. The second thing we have been doing to try and bridge this gap between the monetary and the economic is uh, bringing much more discipline to national economic policies. And that is the discussion which is now going on. We did a couple of things like introducing the so-called macroeconomic indicators in the six-pack, um, and we can discuss more of the particulars afterwards. And uh, the European Council has now been working and continues working on what we call the contractualization of uh, recommendations now. This of course, this sounds very Chinese, and it is. But since very long, every year, the Commission sends economic recommendations individually tailor-made to each member country, to each and every member country. And to some countries, it says you have to, do, <coughs> to adapt your system of uh, automatic wage indexation. To other countries, it says you have to do away with the fact that you cannot fire people, and so on and so forth. All this <coughs> is very well known. And this always has remained much of a bureaucratic exercise. The proposal which has now been made uh, to have this, these recommendations into some form of contract between the institutions and the individual member states, presumably commitments to be approved by national parliaments, is an attempt to bring to the political level, to the level where people can decide, what uh, up till now are very intelligent, economically very sound recommendations, but which were recommendations and recommendations are recommendations are recommendations. So that is what we have been doing to try and bridge this gap between the monetary and the economic and make sure that this gap between the two becomes, uh, becomes smaller because if it remains too big, we remain with the basic, uh, basic difficulty we, uh, we have discovered in the very beginning. Some people say that over time, and what is over time, our economies will become more competitive. Uh, if, of course, yes, you practice budgetary discipline, you practice a number of sound economic recommendations in your national economic policies, arguably that should lead to a more competitive uh, economy. And that is, of course, the aim. Because if our economies do not become more competitive, our common future looks rather bleak. Does that now mean that we have all opted in in what some people call a, Germanic, uh, 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 a German economic model? Yes and no. All these budgetary discipline, national, econ uh, national economic policy disciplines are, uh, of course, uh, part and parcel of having bought into, uh, into this currency which comes together with an economic policy. But I have to say that a number of things which we have been doing, which the states have been doing, <coughs> uh, and which the central bank have been doing, uh, were totally new. Uh, the member states have, been cre have created the safety nets, EMS, we didn't have an EMS because it should not exist, it could not exist, and it was not to exist, it exists now. So that was highly new, highly unforeseen. 
the policies which the central bank has been following, like lately uh, the outright monetary transactions, have transformed as well the modus operandi of the uh, European Central Bank. So you see, people say, well, we are just <clears throat> being dragged into a German-style economic policy. It's not entirely true, uh, because the reverse is true as well. We are doing a number of things, the ones I mentioned, which in the past would certainly not have passed muster. Maybe a third, uh, third point on um, redistribution of power. There's a whole discussion in, in, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in the European Union whether the Franco-German partnership has been transformed from a, a senior, from an equal partnership into a, a senior-junior partnership. Uh, I think uh, one should always uh, watch out to be, uh, to be too black and whitish about these things. It's obvious that when we are talking about the economy, and given the origin of our common currency, that Germany would be in the lead. But I've been involved as well as Chief of Staff of Van Rompuy with the decision-making for the Libya campaign. And there it was obviously that <coughs> it was Paris in uh, the driving seat. So before we start having a kind of a general new rule about, uh, about parity or non-parity between uh, the two countries which are at the, at the, base, at the basis of uh, uh, the European Union, uh, we should be careful not to take uh, one event as being the harbinger of a general rule to come. It very much depends on the circumstances. As far as uh, uh, Great Britain is concerned and uh, Prime Minister uh, Cameron's uh, speech, uh, we certainly will have the occasion, given the time which we have to discuss about that, in the second part of our meeting. Now, I would like to go to, uh, to my fourth and last point. It's about the institutions. It's obvious that the European Council concentrates a lot of power. But that is nothing new. If you look at the ones of us, uh, and there are a number of them among us who have lived uh, and participated in European councils, uh, councils before it had a permanent president, even then, major decisions were always taken at the level of the heads of state and, and, uh, and government. Um, when uh, Herman van Rompuy became uh, president, uh, that, of course, made the, uh, embodied the, the decisions which the uh, Treaty of Lisbon had taken with a permanent president, which gives you experience, which gives you authority, and which gives you uh, more uh, authority. Uh, he paid particular attention to, uh, to two things. First of all, um, uh, we never uh, accepted the idea that the European Council should be the enemy, the battering ram against the Commission of the European Parliament. And I think this is not only a question of words. Everybody who has been following on a more daily basis, what happens in Brussels knows that <clears throat> the President of the European Council has tried to develop a cooperative model with the other institutions. And uh, we have been, behind it is the line of reasoning that uh, the common interest is very badly served if the uh, institutions are at loggerheads, and that only if the institutions on a number of subjects have a consensus and a convergent, convergent ideas, that only then and only then will they have influence in uh, capitals in member states. But the fact remains, the European Council is and will remain one of the most important, if not the most important, center of power and decision making in uh, Brussels for the foreseeable future. But that doesn't mean the Commission itself, and I'm now <coughs> um, acquired uh, a lot of competences, a lot of powers, budgetary powers policy vetting powers, and this, uh, uh, the ones who say that this is a zero-sum game, that, that <coughs> what the one wins is lost by the other, uh, have been found, found wrong. I th uh, if you see now for budgetary discipline how powerful the Commission is uh, in the discussions with, uh, with countries, 
Remember again the discussion with Spain last year. So the Commission cannot say that the fact that it has a powerful European uh, Council is at the to the detriment of the European Commission, the European Commission itself has been more present. Which brings us, of course, to the question of the democratic deficit and to the question of legitimacy uh, and to the question <coughs> of the European Parliament, which being directly elected is the, um, the, the obvious standard bearer of uh, democracy within, within the system. On paper, uh, you can, of course, say that the whole um, institutional system is perfectly uh, legitimized uh, from the democratic point of view, because, well, in the European Council, prime ministers are heads of governments which have been democratically elected, so what is the democratic deficit? You can say the commission, well, the commissioners have been appointed by the European Council and the European Parliament, itself uh, <coughs> the fruit of direct elections. Uh, so I think when people talk, talk, about, uh, talk about democratic deficit in the sense that mechanically there is a lack of democratic deficit, I think it's not a strong argument. Uh, I think it can be countermounted quite easily. <laughs> but there is, of course, a real problem of the broader public opinion perceiving decisions emanating out of Brussels as being legitimate. Uh, as being mandated, and uh, there obviously there has been a deficit for a long time, and there is a deficit still, which uh, <coughs> uh, of course in times of crisis becomes more visible because then everybody's attuned to what happens in, in the course of this crisis, and people see that decisions affect them then uh, on a daily basis are taking, uh, being taken far away. Personally, but again, I'm very much uh, a European integrationist, I think this question will only be of legitimacy of Brussels institutions, uh, legitimacy as opposed to the mechanical formal uh, democratic uh, <coughs> legitimacy. Uh, I think that will be only addressed if we go in for further, uh, further integration. But again, I show my colors. I'm a, a European integrationist. Then, um, maybe to conclude, and I'm already speaking too long, I no, think. Okay. Uh, it's being, a, like so many of you, a professional national diplomat. I'm particularly uh, attuned to see how, what is or standing today in the international community. And it is obvious that as a consequence, and I was Sherpa to the G8 and the G20 meetings, and it's obvious that as a consequence of the Euro crisis, our international, uh, international standing took a hit. But at the same time, I am an optimist. I've seen so many instances where a country, a country international credit took a hit, but generally it only takes a couple of years before it's, uh, it's forgotten. So I wouldn't make uh, too much of it. But there is something else. Um, the fact that, uh, and it's linked to, strangely linked to, to, to foreign policy, the fact that we are um, not perceived as more being m more integrated makes that difficulties in one country are much more easily perceived by the markets as being a, uh, a beginning of the end, or to make my sa the same point in another way, if uh, uh, a state government in the United States uh, goes broke, that doesn't endanger national uh, economic policy and that doesn't endanger uh, the currency, and which proves that the same causes over there produce different effects because the paradigm they are operating under is elsewhere than the paradigm we are operating under. And the paradigm we are operating under is the paradigm of uh, an integration which is some way halfway between one state, one vote, and one man, one vote, 
but which is uh, certainly not accomplished. And, uh, and there I would like to uh, leave it at that. Thank you.